Welcome back to the Women in Sports podcast. It's episode six. My name is Lois Lossell and today I'm joined by Tanya Arnold. Tanya, you're used to asking the questions, so a little bit of pressure on me. Um, I'll have to make sure that I'm, I'm on top form or try my best, but it's going to be a great opportunity to get to know a little bit more about you, talk about your career because it's, it's, it's been a brilliant one um, and still still going and speak to you about women's sport. We've been a real integral part of um, the Lee Dryer women's journey as, as just one. Um, and and influenced that quite a bit from the start, from the outset. So just speak to you, all things women's sport. But we'll start off first because it's a bit of a, a weird time at the moment. How how are you getting on? I'm all right. It, it's a funny one for me because we I'm not in lockdown in that we're still working. You know, my day job is BBC Look North. There's obviously not a lot of sport to do, and I'm really beginning to miss the Super League show and asking inane questions about rugby league. I can't wait for that to come back. So I'm doing an awful lot of news which at times is quite heavy um, and not something I'm used to. Um, and I've had to do some, you know, quite heavy duty stories, um, which haven't been fun. Um, but then we're mixing in, we're, we're really trying hard to reflect the really good things that the community are doing. Um, you know, just so many different things. But, you know, on week one, I did a, an amazing uh, group of staff at a care home who'd left their own families behind to move in to make sure the, the patients were, were cared for and were safe. And went back last week to see how they were getting on. So, I mean, that's that's been really nice to do. Other bits of it, I have to say, it is quite draining. But I'm not going to do Lally because I'm stuck um, stuck in the house the whole time. In, in that respect, I feel really lucky because I know a lot of people are finding that really difficult. So there's there's still the routine there to me of work, but it's, it's very, very difficult. And I have to say, I take my hat off particularly to our technical staff because obviously we don't have many people in the office. You think of a gallery, it's long and thin and, and you can't have people next to each other and, and the cameramen are having to work overtime to, to make sure everything's self-distanced and all the rest of it, but still try and get interviews. You know, we're editing in cars beside each other, sometimes by Zoom conference calls and all the rest of it. It's, it's a, a very different way of working, but I'm in hats off to our team that, that we're still, I think, delivering very good programmes. So you're obviously really, really busy. Um, while you were speaking about that, then I was actually trying to remember what what day it was today because <laughs> it's every everything's merging into one. So it's I've, I saw the the one that you um, the story you're on about in the care home. There's so many people doing so many great jobs, and there's so much negative things that you can focus on. But the biggest thing is that all the positivity of communities pulling together, people putting themselves out there to help others, and I'm sure that. We'll look back on it at, at some point and be really, really proud about how, as a nation, as a country, we came together. Um, what What are you doing to keep yourself busy on your on your days off? Then are you still training pretty hard? I know you had some some big sporting events coming up, so are you still training hard, or is it are you finding it hard to fit things in? I, I am training quite hard. Um, I've actually trained so today. Today is in theory my day off, um, but I'm also doing the shopping. Um, so I've got for all the shopping. So my day started in the supermarket at eight o'clock this morning and I need coffee to start the day and I'm shopping before I've had coffee. So I slightly, slightly feel for the other people around me. Yeah, but so far, so good. Actually, almost the most stressful part of that is I'm shopping for um, elderly neighbours as well. And they're very particular about what they want. And, and, you know, when you're shopping for something, I've, you know, I've never looked for it. I don't even know where to find it. And there's a particular type of custard they want that it's just not coming back. I don't think it's going to come back to this, but I go every time and look on the shelf for them. Um, so I've done that. I've trained today. Um, I'm actually doing some filming later on today, even though it's my day off or something for next week. Um, but I'm I'm trying to actually exercise I found is really, really important. So we're now deploying from home. So you don't get up, go into the office like we normally do. There's a conference call at, at 9.30. And if I'm not going straight out, I'm trying to do a little bit in the garage. Um, I actually ran, what you're talking about is boxing, isn't it? No, no, no. <laughs> thing that I am put my hand up to do the Rob Byron boxing whether it goes ahead this year it may end up being pushed to next year I should imagine but I, I started training with John Hagen and Josh Warrington's dad and, and trainer and I have to say I was loving it I was really loving it still one-on-one -on -one. nobody else tried to hit me um which was great because I'm slightly dreading that bit but I was really missing him so I rang him yesterday on my way home from work because I drive past um, quite near where the gym is uh, and had a little chat with him and I have we have got a punch bag in the garage which we actually got for my son to, to work out his aggression in his teenage years so that's getting a bit of a pummeling um, and we're quite lucky to, because he does some stuff we've kind of built up some weights and things like that and we're out in the countryside a bit so I go for a run have done a couple of bike rides a little bit twitchy about falling off the bike and ending up you know injuring myself uh, and finding myself in hospital so I'm, I'm sort of trying to keep that down to a minimum and 
the relative newbie on, on road cycling. That was sort of last year's challenge. I got back on the road, but I hadn't been on it for months. I couldn't remember which way the gears worked and all the rest of it. It was a very steady opening ride. So, yeah, no, I am trying really hard, actually, to keep fit. And I know it's, um, I think, quite important for the sanity. I'm not trying to do anything stupid. And um, just, you know, if, if you're not quite in the mood, just do what you feel like doing and not feel like you failed because you haven't done something epic that day. But just know that you need to do a little bit, even if it's go for a walk. There's, there's been some piglets down the end of one of the walks um, and I filmed, I filmed them the other day and just said yeah if you're missing your sport here's a bit of piglet racing and it's like therapy going on watching them and that's that's been lovely so I'm trying to keep active uh, in and amongst the work. I saw so I saw the piglet racing um, <laughs> is that what we're resorting to? <laughs> absolutely I mean have you seen there's there's an absolutely brilliant one Andrew Cotter one of the um, BBC commentators has been doing absolutely epically brilliant commentary on his two Labradors um, and there's just a couple and the second one was just priceless they're not doing anything particularly but he's doing it as a proper commentary and they're just so funny and yes I'm afraid piglet racing is is, is what we are resorting to now and, and how long you going? The, the cycling um, yeah. The cycling, so I had two challenges last year. So this, um, we went and did Ride London, the short, shorter one, not the hundred. And I, as one of those, there's a, a lovely girl in our our office called Sally, who um, had to have a leg amputated, above knee amputee, uh, in her twenties for for um, bone marrow cancer, bone uh, cancer, and then ten years on, completely unrelated, got breast cancer. And you think, how unlucky can you be? And she's a bit of a heroine in our office, quite frankly. And she said, I'm, uh, I'm ambassador for the um, breast cancer awareness and they're the chosen charity for this bike ride. Will you do it? And we all just go, yes, Sally, of course we will. And then it's like, a, I don't actually own a road bike. Uh, how many miles are we doing? How are we getting there? And all the rest of it. But we all said yes. Um, and somebody lent me a road bike and I then subsequently bought one and did the two swans, three swans around Selby. But I'm a bit of a fair weather biker. So if it's cold, if it's wet, if it's windy, <laughs> I've got every excuse in the book not to get out there. Um, but I've done a couple of rides in the last couple of weeks, which has been really nice. Um, it, it, it with the running. I think I've got a 50-50 um, success rate on the road bike. I've gone it 50% of the time and I'm fine. And 50% of the time I fall off. I fell off the other day. I, just, I forget that I've got to clip my feet out. Oh, and... You see, I haven't done the clipped in yet. Um, really? Because I, can't, I, was, I was on an ordinary hybrid bike for the first half of the training for this London thing. Then I got lent a bike and I, I literally, I had never been on a road bike. I had to Google how you change the gears. I felt a right <laughs> muppet. Um, and it was just, you know, she, it came with ordinary pedal. And this is just a stretch too far to then start learning how to clip in and all the rest of it. And then I bought a new bike and but fairly soon was doing so. And I thought, no, this isn't the time to clip in. And then the bike went in the, in the garage. So I've got the pedals and I've got the fancy shoes just haven't gone that far yet <laughs> and now's not the time because if it fall off this isn't a good time to fall off the bike you just have to go somewhere that's there's, there's little traffic um but i went on i did one after it was in september i think and i absolutely loved it and it were in halifax which was awful because it's just hill You're after hill. um but it, it's really good and the fact that when you clipped in you get so much more um power through your legs as well so you definitely got to give it a go and just I, I fall off all the time and it's just one of those things. We'll move on. So what so where did where did the love of sport come from from you then? Because obviously you spoke, you, you're really passionate about sport. So what was that something that you knew quite early doors that you just absolutely love sport and you wanted to have a career in that? Where, where did it begin? I uh, I did just love all sport. Um I'm I'm a baby of the grandstand era, so just watched sport. Um it I wasn't necessarily a particular sport. Um did a lot of different sports. I always look back and think, what if, a little bit, in that I loved cricket and I, I could bowl. I, was, I wasn't brilliant. I, I have no idea how good I was because girls didn't really get to play cricket. So when you got to that old age when it was no longer really acceptable to play with the boys, that was kind of the end of cricket for me. Um, similarly with football, um, I played netball, but we there wasn't a great team around me. I did athletics, but again, I, I wasn't brilliant at it. The, my, my only sporting success was I was the rounders ball throwing champion for London um, at the uh, age of 10, um, which, you know, London's a big place. I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, but when you get to javelins, it sort of got a bit too too serious at that point. So I always loved doing sport. I wasn't particularly brilliant. I was competent at a few sports. Um, but I loved watching it. 
Um, and I went to cricket. I had a real love of cricket, and I still have a real love of cricket. Um, and I love the scoring. It's a weird thing. Somewhere, unless they've thrown them all out, tucked away in, in a basement somewhere, there's probably a box of old cricket scoring things. And I, I just like the patterns and the numbers and, and just you know following the day's play. It was very restful, I think, and um, enjoyed that. And I mean, that's where I first came across rugby league was on grandstand with the you know, money pitches on a on a Saturday afternoon. So I, th I think I've always liked it. I didn't really put two and two together of a career in it, in that there weren't any women presenting it or reporting on it, really. You know, when I was growing up. So I look back and and sort of you know you you look at all the things I did, and it was an obvious thing. And people saying, "Oh, you must have dreamed of this is what you wanted to do." And, and no, I didn't because I didn't really put two and two together. I've ended up doing it. I got quite lucky. Um, in terms of I had a newsroom that didn't really like sport, so I kind of started filling in doing a bit of sport. And then the person in front of me, the person who, Damien Johnson, who was, was then the sports reporter, um, who I now get to work with on the rugby league, um, he went off on an attachment initially, so it was advertised internally. So I got lucky, really, in terms of, of really getting into it. Um, but there was, I mean, Helen Rollison was probably the first person I really remember presenting sport. And she, I think for any of us, coming through now it really she was really for me the trailblazer uh, and went through a hell of a lot um and you know a little bit of it if, if the team behind you are not if you're not all pulling in the same direction your particularly live telly is a very very um open sort of almost naked place to be you are completely exposed and she dealt with people not thinking she should be there and, and clearly not thinking she should be there and i can't even imagine how hard that must have been for her so that you know, Helen Rollison was a real trailblazer, and, and Ellie Aldroyd, who um, you know, I've, I've got to work with a couple of times and, and be around, and she's fabulous. And, and Hazel Irving is, is somebody else as well that I've come across, and Claire Balding, who's been very supportive on the way up. But I, I, you go sort of back, back. It, it was definitely uh, Helen Rollison, who I think we all owe a lot to. She's inspirational, and um, you say you know you you fell into it, but you you've you've had a great career, and. You have been inspirational for a lot of women watching the sport because it's obviously a male-dominated sport is rugby league, but having people like yourself who were there reporting on it and you know encouraging across the board participation, but also you know for women to spectate, it, spectate the game and stuff like that, um, and it, it's been absolutely amazing. But like you said, having those people before you have made real, really, real, real impact, and that's what I was going to ask: is there anyone that's particularly inspired you either to this day or within your career like who who has provided that inspiration because it's still you've still brought down so many barriers within within the game um to be to be at the heights of, of your career doing what you're doing as well i don't think there's one specific i mean helen morrison was i say she, she she knocked down quite a lot of doors um and you know i i've been quite lucky in that when i when i got up to network level the door was that was open um you know she had done the kind of hard work um there's there's people i've learned a lot from um that i've worked with um, i mean actually harry gration is one i mean harry is a, he's an absolutely natural presenter and i you know co-presented co look north i was the stand-in for, for five years with him and learned a huge amount of off him and obviously replaced him on the super league show which was was quite an ask um claire balding was fabulous to work with um Hazel Irvin, who you know, to come back to her, I, I met her down in Sheffield doing the snooker, and I was just, I was just doing a piece for Look North, and it, it was a ridiculous bit. They made me do an end item on something that just wasn't a funny end item, and I was trying to get something funny and bounced up to her and said, you know, hello, my name's Tanya Arnold, I work for the local. And she said, I know exactly who you are because I watch it when I down here, I'm, I'm down here, and you're very good. And she really didn't need to say that. And it was lovely. It was just the loveliest thing. And she was busy doing a you know, proper story. She said, I'll, I'll come and find you when I finish. And lo and behold, she did. Did a lovely piece for us. And, you just, you know, she was, it was just a really nice way to behave and, and be around. And she's somebody who's an absolute consumer professional. And I, I worked with her editor on the snooker. He's, he's been my rugby league editor. And he said, you know, she, she's just incredible in terms of the homework that she does, the calmness on air. Um, but to be that supportive of, you know, of a young pup coming through as well, I think is, is absolutely fantastic. And Claire Balding was fabulous with me as well and gave me some very good advice about, um, you yeah, know, doing, doing interviews. Uh, um, you know, don't try and show off what you think you know. Um, you know you're there to ask questions. Um, but there's also been people behind the scenes for me, which um, Carl, who was my first editor, Sally Richardson, who, who directs, I've done a lot with, she does the highlights programs when we get to the 
and playoffs and she did all the highlights programs when I did the World Cup and stuff like that and she's been fantastic because she keeps you in line in terms of but she I, I remember her just saying I don't I know I know you're worried about this but she said I don't need to know what you do or don't know you're there to ask the questions of people who do know and I've always kind of you know I, I'm, I'm not I'm not like you I didn't grow up in rugby league land I'm not, not an aficionado in that respect but my job is to ask questions of the people who are um, and to nudge the program and, and give them as much you know, airtime as possible. You're, you're, you're there almost as a facilitator, I, I think, um, rather than to try and show off and say what you think happened or whatever. You know, I, who the heck am I when I'm sitting across the table from, from two top players or coaches or, or whatever? So rugby league has been really, really kind to me as a sport. Um, and it's been very, very welcoming in a way that some others haven't. I mean, football was is still, I, I still find football quite hard to be around, if I'm going to be brutally honest. Not, not all of it, and you know, some great clubs to deal with and stuff like that, but it can be quite an aggressive environment. Um, and, and that's the one where you tend to get, you know, if you make a mistake, and hey, we all make mistakes. The, the thing I, I absolutely loathe is, I didn't make the mistake because I'm a woman. I just made the mistake. If a bloke made the mistake, he didn't make it because he was a bloke, did he? He just made the mistake. So why did I make the mistake? Because I'm a woman. Um, and, you know, you do get that a lot more, I think, at football. It's a much more aggressive of, you know, what the hell are you doing around my sport? Um, uh, uh, aggression around it. Um, and social media, I suppose, hasn't helped that. Like you said, the, the issue of being a woman within sport is also look, already looked at as, you know, some people absolutely love it, some people still question it, and we, and we see it much more now because of social media as well. That That's become much harder. So I guess when you're saying about all the women that were around you and supported you, having that sort of sisterhood of actually encouraging each other because you know that it's quite a difficult environment to be in it is really, really brilliant. And you speak about rugby there being really kind to you, but it is it is a fantastic sport. And I know you're saying there that you haven't, you haven't always been involved, so you, you want it to sometimes show that you have done your homework, you do know your stuff, but it's such a hard job doing what you do. Like, I've had a tiny, tiny taste of it, and there's so much more to think about than what you'd realise and to to balance what you need to say and what you don't need to say. You're 100% right. So what what are the biggest things that you learned then? Is that the, the finding the balance between asking questions and actually just letting people speak? What were the biggest thing that you, you learned along the way? I think you, I'm still learning. That would be the, the the most important thing I'd say is is you know I think if you ever think I know everything, then you're in a really dangerous place. Um, and I, I have learned lessons you know from other people, and I think actually that then helps you to be yourself. You've got to get to the point where, and I you know I've, I've stood in for for Claire Balding and Mark Chapman, which gives you a pretty big chip on your shoulder because they are two of the very best that we've got. And I think almost particularly with Mark. Could, because Claire was not doing, you know, she didn't do as much rugby league. Um, I think she came in, she's just an incredible presenter with an amazing enthusiasm for the sport and did brilliant things when she was in it. But I suppose I could play the slightly other card of, you know, I'm doing this week in, week out, and I could, I, it was a bit different. Mark does more of it because he has the radio stuff as well, and, and he's he's grown up with it a bit more, I think. I, you know, when I take a, took over from Mark, when I stand in for him, he's like, I'm going to play some Mark Chapman. And actually what I've learned is, is don't worry about that. You know, Mark does what Mark does. Mark does what Mark does brilliantly. Um, be yourself. Do what you do. Um, and I think when I did the six hours of the semi-finals and, and the women's final last year, um, I think I've probably finally got over the I'm just the stand-in bit. I am the stand-in and I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, but you kind of just find your own voice and do what you do. Uh, what, what we're going to ask you then, obviously, is I've, I've heard you speak quite a bit about um, interviewing, like tough interviews. You do you do quite a tough job, especially when emotions are running high. Whether that's you know it might be a final, a semi final, and you've got you've got to um, you've got to ask you've got to speak to coaches. And I've I've heard you speak about different coaches that you've spoken to. And it's a learning curve isn't it, of how you've got to speak to them. And some people react well to certain questions. Like what what's the most memorable interviews that you've done? The most memorable is going to be Wayne Bennett. Um, <laughs> that uh, what I did learn with Wayne Bennett is it's not personal. I mean that was that was quite important because that was just scary. Um, I think one of the things is, yeah, I've not played the game, so there's no point in me saying you should have done this or should you have done that because who the heck am I? 
I'm quite lucky with the BBC that we um, very much look at it as not necessarily a specialist audience. You want people who can who just drop into the sport to understand so we don't get too technical generally about the questions. Um, it, you know, it's that post-match. We Pre-match, you can think about what you're going to ask. You've done your homework. You've prepared. There's there's pieces that it's going in and out of. There's particular points that they want made for the punditry and stuff like that. That's relatively straightforward, unless it's Wayne Bennett. Um, it's the post-match when, as you say, the emotions are running high. And even sometimes people who have won, I remember, you know, I've interviewed Tony Smith when he's won, but he, he wasn't happy with what his team had done. Um, and, you know, that, and it's people you know really, really well. Um, I think, you know, people say, oh, you know, you, you ask how you're feeling this time. Well, if you've just won a game and got to a final, you know, you, there is an element of how does that feel? I don't know. I've not done it. How does it? And, and people say, oh, God, it's a stupid question. Well, it, it, not and there's only so many ways of asking it you can find different ways of asking it and all the rest of it um i mean wayne bennett was an uh, it was tortuous the first time i did it i've done a charity dinner with him it was the four nations his first tournament in charge i knew he didn't like the media i can't say i was looking forward to the tournament done a charity dinner with him um, and interviewed him on stage where we i sat next to him at dinner and i i'm you know when you can hear your own knife and fork everybody else is chatting and you can almost hear your own silence because he doesn't do small talk over dinner either and the only time he warmed up was when he was being slaughtering the media and how much he didn't like them um he was great up on stage but don't expect it to be this easy on saturday which you know, I don't. literally i didn't ask a single closed question you know none of them were yes no questions no statements at him the opening question so when you haven't had much time with the team, what kind of things have you been focusing? Oh, just training hard. Full stop. And you're just like, you're, suddenly you think, your brain just goes, whoa, 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 give me a bit of time. I haven't got the next question. The next question's not there yet. So we went on like this. And between questions about four and five, if you listen back to it, you could hear me laugh. With a kind of, seriously, this is how we play? Yep. And then all I'm so, but he literally was giving me three word um, answers, which equates to a second. Because if you ever write a script, three words is a second. Um, and it, it, he was all right after that. It was, the, it was the first one that he did that I found really difficult. And actually through the rest of the series, he wasn't too bad. People made a lot about one of the interviews, which I didn't have an issue with him about. It was other people listening back made an issue out of something that I didn't think he was. And, but actually, when he did the New Zealand series, when he came back, he was fabulous. I really enjoyed him. He was, he was great. I was I was so nervous doing it because, you know, memories <laughs> of what he'd done before. I remember doing the first pre-match interview and I texted the editor going, yeah, it's been great. Can I finish now, please? Can I, can I just bail out now? And got a text message from Justin Morgan, who was doing the, um, the game down in New Zealand. So, I got loads out of way. Well done. There's nothing different. And, it, you know, we hadn't I think he just realised that that we weren't out to get him. We didn't care what club he was going to be coaching. We didn't care what was going on. We just wanted England to win because it's really important for the game over here. And actually, that's all we want. Um, so Wayne, Wayne Bennett was, yeah, I mean, he's been, he, he was hard. He was hard. And then you've done interviews where you've had to ask questions that they don't want you to ask. You know, Steve McNamara during the World Cup when players got into trouble and stuff like that. And, you know, the little voice in your ear, you probably had that with the earpiece in and he says, ask this question. And you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> ask the question. Um, Brian McDermott, he's always he was he's always an interesting one to ask. Um, I have to say, has always been fabulous with me. It doesn't make him any less scary when he looks down at you from a, an angle and he's got like he's eyeing you. Um, but he's always been fantastic. He answers. He's actually I really like interviewing him because he gives you different answers. Um, but I remember being asked to ask him something. I went, no, no, no don't, don't make me ask him that. I know he's going to say no, 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 Tanji, you've got to ask me. No, 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 no. And I said, look, I'm really sorry, I've got to ask you this. And he looked down at me and he said, you know, you could ask me anything, Tans. And it was just like gauntlet thrown down at me. Oh, yeah, OK, right. Um, but, you know, he's, he's been great. And I've got some, some cracking interviews with him, to be honest. So, you know, you've you just got to learn that people in and around a match. I mean, John Key, I managed to upset John Key on the second game I ever did for Network. Yeah, your eyebrows raised. I've just seen your eyebrows go up. The nicest man in rugby. <laughs> It wasn't that the question was wrong. It was the way that I asked it in the heat of the moment after a game. Um, and I went, I ran up to him because I heard he wasn't happy and I ran up to apologize. And we, we, God, we laugh about it. I spent a huge amount of time with John. I'm hugely fond of him. Um, but it, was, it wasn't the wrong question. I just didn't ask it very well. Um, and you do that. And, you know, Twitter will tell you what a stupid question that was. Well, actually, 
you know what, sometimes it's not as easy as you think because, you know, it's the umpteenth interview you've done in a row um, and and it's not necessarily that you're saying the wrong thing, you just, the words didn't come out in quite the way that retrospectively you'd like them to have done. Um, so you're always learning because it's new people and, and they're all different and people that you know quite well in one environment in and around a match, you know, when the emotions are high, that they're, they're very different. And you've got the... <laughs> You've got to know your um, audience as well with rugby league as well, aren't you? And it must be quite tough here because we've all seen those. Have you been um, part of an interview where there's been a, a swear word dropped post game, pre game, in the game? I don't think I have had a live one of those. I've nearly sworn live on air. Look, North got out just in time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, that was career nearly went. I I, you know, I counted the countdown that I was off air, and they hadn't actually cut away. Um, I was about, um, I was well away from the studio and I'd been stitched up like a kipper. And I'm trying to think, I haven't, because uh, at Sky I've had a couple. Um, but actually, I also think, I mean, it's different for us in that you know, we're quite off and on in the afternoon, but if you're on at 10 o'clock at night, I always think when you hear, you know, during the boxing, for instance, when it's 11 o'clock at night and you may or may not have picked up a swear word in the corner and they apologise, you're thinking, what do you think? You're going to hear, you know, as viewers. What do you think you're going to get? I mean, sometimes I think that, that I mean, not for us, because I think we're on during the middle of the day and all the rest of it. Um, don't think anybody's sworn on the Super League show, or if they have, because we pre-recorded it, we'll have stopped and done it again. <laughs> um, don't think so. I think I have had to, I, the, the funniest one I've been involved with, but it wasn't me in the chair. I was waiting to interview um, Paul Anderson after Leeds had beaten them in a Challenge Cup. So I've got a losing coach who's not very happy, and we're keeping him waiting. And they had a dressing room shot of, of the Rhinos. And Rob Burrow was there, and and yes, you're laughing. It's, the, the towel was moved, and um, he wasn't wearing anything underneath. And it goes away very quickly from the dressing room shot. And then there's, I can hear the whole of the gallery going, "Did did, did we see something we shouldn't see?" Yeah, I think we did. Right, um, and you can hear them. Uh, Mark Chapman's still presenting. He doesn't quite know what's happened because he's not looking at the shot. And then you hear the, um, "We're going to have to do an apology." Um, right, Mark, you're going to have to apologise because we've seen bit Rob. <laughs> you hey Mark, just take a deep breath and say, I'm going to do something I never thought I'd have to do. If you saw a bit of Robert Burrow that you shouldn't have seen, we do apologize. Yeah, I think John Wilkin was one of them. You can imagine one of them. And then they cut to me with Paul Anderson, who just lost it. Oh, but I'm listening to I and mean, I was saying it's absolute stitches listening to the process that was going on of the realization of what they may or may not have seen, and they were gonna have to do an apology. Glad I wasn't <laughs> presenting. <laughs> But my, my, I was speaking to my dad and I said I was doing this podcast and he, he said, like, ask her about a time when, she, I can't remember, I think he would have finally said, ask her about when Tom Lyman tried to get her in a headlock. So I don't oh, know who that was. Yeah, I didn't, that was, Tommy Lyman, that wasn't on telly, was he, was he there? I, he might have been there, no. Yeah, know. no, Tommy, Tommy wasn't playing um, and I've had a little bit to drink. And he actually just he kissed me on the top of my head. He wasn't trying to get me in a headlock. Normally, people ask me about trying to tackle Danny Houghton. <laughs> you know, I always seem to get people who've held on me, but you let them go, and then they say, oh, We're coming to you, and you're like, Ah! And you're trying to re- grab them. And yes, the Danny Houghton was the famous one <laughs> of the, the umpteenth tackle. So, so, I'm going to speak to you about two spots. So, you said earlier on about that you love cricket and uh, quite, a, quite a good bowler, won awards in rounders. We'll have, to, we'll have to get you on the next with Courtney, what do you reckon? Because she were a bowler when she played. Yeah, she wouldn't want to be in there now. I, last time I tried to bowl a ball, I, the, the element of exactly where the release spot is for the perfect ball has disappeared. It'll either go at her head or, it, or it'll just drop in front of me. <laughs> Those yeah, well, days are long gone. I, I, she keeps saying to me, because um, she keeps saying to me, we'll go to the next, we'll have a go. But I think her partner, Laws, she's a batter, so we'll, we'll just have to throw it, throw it at Laws and I'm sure she'll maybe get one or two decent ones along the way and then I, w- I was thinking so you're obviously involved in rugby and you've built a great a great knowledge base and stuff like that and you've you've followed the women's game you've been brilliant in 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 helping us influence that moving forward and we'll speak about that in a minute but if you were gonna if you're gonna have a game what position come on hypothetical hypothetically <laughs> if you were gonna play what position would you be <laughs> I, I genuinely um, never played rugby in my life. Neither at one point. Part of me says on the wing because you're a little bit up, but then I've got no speed. So that wouldn't really help me much. And then the thought of you know Conrad Hurrell flying at you to dock you out. And I certainly couldn't do the flying finishes then. Adam. Genuinely, I just think no. I mean, know your limitations. And, and I'm happy to watch the game. 
not to get involved no. any further. I, I, I really have no idea what I could or couldn't do. I, I, I don't, I've never even considered a position. I've never considered playing, let alone a position. That's far too much detail. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So 2017, we asked you if you would get involved. So it was the launch of the Leeds Rhinos Women. And um, we were sat in a meeting and we said, you know, let's let's invite someone who can really help build some profile. And your name was one of the, the first one that came to mind. And we asked you and thought, you know, stab in the dark, see whether you'd, you'd get involved. And you did. And it were it added so much to the night. But what what were your thoughts then? So we obviously told you what was happening. Going to have a Leeds Rhinos women's teams. Do you think it would have gone as well as it maybe had, or what were your thoughts for the for the launch of it? I, I would, without wishing uh, given it's your podcast, but I was really really. I mean, you spoke fabulously with an incredible passion for the project. Um, and Gary, I thought Gary Hetherington spoke very well as well, very much from the heart. And I remember being really, really impressed by your sponsors, Mears, of, of why they were getting involved with you, because it kind of matched what they wanted to do within their business of getting women to do jobs that are not necessarily, you know, thought of as women's jobs. And I just kind of walked away from the whole thing, just feeling this was great. It was a great project. Um, I don't do you not think you were going to you know, win what you won in the first year? I mean, it's probably throw it back at you. Um, it was a, clearly a big club that had that, you know, and they had, you know, you'd come across from a, a treble winning side. Yeah, you know, they had some good people in there. You know that, but you know, you, you are, you then had people who never played the game. Um, so I suppose I don't think I knew enough about the women's game to know, you know, how much strength you'd brought across. I'm not sure you probably, you not probably knew how well it would gel, did you? Because you, you know, you were holding, you know, open trials and all the rest of it, and we're getting people who've never played the game who turned out to be darn good at it. So I'm not sure you guys knew. Um, and you created something quite special, um, you know, within probably within those first few months, actually, before you started winning trophies and stuff like that. Just that process of of bringing the team together. I think I think that you're right in what you said. Is it were it was just it, looking back, it was so weird. And speaking at that night, that's probably the first time I've really done anything public speaking wise. So I was sweating and just I knew the people in the room, the England coach in the room, who I was going to be going to Australia with in the next couple of um couple of months and there'd been so many question marks around you know can you do it you just you wanting to just build a team out of nothing and in fairness we were but that brought so much strength to it the fact that you were a clean slate and that you could start from the bottom and that was probably the most exciting thing and having the backing of gary and the club was absolutely massive so from day one it's never been a that's a women's thing and that's a men's rugby thing. It's a it's a lead rhinos thing and let's do it together and get the best outcome. So 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 lucky in that respect. And then like you say, Mia's I were lucky enough to go to um Birmingham um with Sophie Robinson to do uh, some speaking at their women's in sports conference and you forget how aligned the two organizations are the fact that we want to give women an opportunity to excel in sport all the way from grassroots right way to the top for super league and internationally and they were just trying to do the same in a in a male dominated environment so they've been brilliant and to have their backing still to this day is absolutely fantastic but i think the way that you spoke and what you brought tonight was absolutely outstanding and and set us off on, on that platform to have a really successful time and i guess there's been loads of different milestones along the way so having the the final live on Sky Sports was one of the best moments I've had in my development career to be able to go into a school and say tonight eight o'clock turn on your TV because women's Super League finals on because you've never been able to give them an actual this is what you can do so what do you what do you think have been the biggest movements for the women's game and what do you think needs to be happening next to see it move even further forward really from your point of view I think I think this year would have been would have been a, a really big year. I mean, I think the World Cup, I think the World Cup could be a game changer for the women's game in this country. Um, and though the women, the structure of the women's game took a bit of explaining, I think, you know, the way they were going to structure it this year, the fact that I can understand the top four being playing each other more often to build up, you know, for those top players, they needed a bit more competition than harden them up for the World Cup. Um, I mean, I think, you know, World Cup, home soil, I know, you know, we'll be right behind it and all the rest of it. Um, and it, you know, Terrestrial Telly just has a big audience. It's not, it's not, you know, us versus Sky or anything like that. Um, it, we just bring a bigger audience to it. And, you know, I, I know we were really committed with the Challenge Cup. 
um, of, of wanting to build the women's game through the Challenge Cup as well. Um, so, I mean, still the World, you know, the World Cup, I think, is going to be going to be huge. I don't quite know what the season holds for anybody, quite frankly. I don't, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what happens with sport for quite some months, and I think that's very difficult for you guys because I think you are moving really, really fast, and it must feel a little bit like somebody's just suddenly shoved a brick wall in front of you. Um, and it's when you will get over or go round or whatever, but it has sort of stalled you. But then it stalled everybody else. Um, you know, they're not playing in Australia either. They've got a slightly different competition, obviously, yeah. over there. But in terms of bringing new people in. Um, you know, I, I just think you've got some really, really exciting young players. Um, and, and that's what's come from the last couple of years. You know, you've 16, 17, 18 year olds bursting onto the scene and, and winning trophies and, and trying to keep them off <coughs> the union. It's going to be interesting. I know you've, you've got mining a, a castle for a while of, of keeping people away from a union. Um, but I, I, I think it's a really exciting time for it. And I do think the World Cup is, is is the biggie. I mean, if you can, if England can get to the final, um, you know, whether you can beat Australia, you know, it's going to be a tough ask because they are that much further ahead as we, we saw at the last World Cup. But, yeah, you get the final on home soil, that's going to be a big, big event. Um, and, and I think the World Cup, they're, they're doing fantastic things with the ticket sales and the way they're marketing that and, and all the rest of it. And hopefully what's happening this year doesn't affect them for next year. Hopefully, I think the Rugby League World Cup are doing an absolute fantastic job. And it's, I think, like you say, it is so exciting. And Leeds is going to be a, a massive hub for it, the fact that Emerald Henley are hosting so many of the events. So I, I do hope that we can build on it year on year. And I think, you know, the, probably the best thing is that, well, not the best thing, that sounds wrong, but obviously with COVID and everything that's happening, everyone's in the same boat. And I think that a good thing with our, with our game at the minute is that because it doesn't take maybe as much money as maybe the NRL for the women in Australia costs, hopefully there's not too much of an impact on what we would have been doing anyways and we can kind of hit the ground running. I do think it would be interesting to see what happens because I know that the, you know, obviously the state of origin aren't going ahead this year for the women and they haven't done the NRL competition over there yet. So it will be interesting to see how they go. But are you looking forward to seeing some new teams on the block? So obviously you'll be involved in covering it quite heavily, but... You know, you've got the likes of Brazil coming over, who we've not seen anything of. Canada are relatively new on their journey. Uh, and PNG seem to, I spoke to Joanna Lester the other day on the podcast. They're just growing and growing from strength to strength. So, are you looking forward to seeing some of them nations visiting Leeds yeah. and, and surrounding areas? Beware PNG. Uh, and they are going to be really, really strong. I mean, yeah, I'm in Brazil playing rugby league. I mean, it's, it is just, it's just brilliant. No, I, I, I'm, I'm really excited about some of them. I, I'm, I feel a little bit in limbo. You know, in terms of, I'm trying not to think too much about rugby because I miss it and I miss my program, um, and that seems like real life again. You know, well, normal life. Um, I am excited, um, and I'm. There's a little bit of me that's disappointed because I know, that, um, yeah, my editor had for, for um, both for the Super League show, but also for the Challenge Cup, we had you know plans in place and all the rest of it. And I hope we get to see some of those through because there's a real. Um, thrust within the BBC for, for just for winning sport, but also to push to try to build the women's game so that you know, the England players, people do not have an idea of who some of them are. Um, it's not just Jody, who's obviously been you know, incredible as an ambassador, but they know the other people involved in it. And I have to say that the Challenge Cup final, um, we put on the red button and then we, we did the extended highlights ahead of the, the um, Challenge Cup semi finals last year, was, was such a good game. And what a brilliant, brilliant advert for the women's game. And I think it was a real eye-opener for, for people. Um, and it was, it was just a brilliant game to watch. Um, so I, I am excited. I'm excited to, to see what happens. I still think, I mean, I do think it's, it is a big ask still for England because, but as you say, I think maybe, you know, that maybe what goes on in Australia this year is, is a levelling out for you guys. Um, I mean, you, you know, the beauty for you is you're not dependent on broadcast deals. You know that you're not sitting there going, "We have to, you know, we need that money to to survive." Um, and having those incredibly difficult discussions and, and negotiations yeah. and things going on, I just hope you get to have some kind of a season. Um, maybe you know, it, it probably they're gonna, undoubtedly they'll have to change the structure in in some way. I'm not sure they're going to be able to do what they wanted to do with the women's game. Um, but I just think it's really, really important because it just seems to be getting stronger so quickly 
that you just don't want that pause, do you? And you're going to be coaching. I know, yeah. yeah, yeah. At, the, at the minute, you know, we're probably it should be about round four or five in the season, and we're still undefeated, so it's all right. <laughs> you're doing well, kid. You're doing well. <laughs> um, so, well, I think that's what you're saying. Is that the, having the game on the red button was absolutely outstanding um, last year for the Challenge Cup final, and last year was tough for me. The fact that I weren't involved, but seeing seeing the game on TV is like I I just didn't think we'd see it as soon as we did. So. Those steps were absolutely amazing. And it's just for people to be able to see the game a little bit more. And like you just said, is making those names household names. Because, you know, we all, we, it, Jodie's doing an amazing job in the Rugby League World Cup. So we're, all, we're getting to know Jodie a bit more. And she's doing some um, some of the games of punditry. And we've got Amy, who's we've seen a bit more about Amy. Now, probably due to her NHS links as well at the moment, because she's doing a brilliant job as a key worker. But it's just getting, the, getting to know the girls' names as, as household names. But... I don't think there's a bigger opportunity to have a World Cup as big as what it's going to be and in England. So the players that play in that next year, and I know they're all working hard, so I do hope that um, you know we're heading in a great direction and hopefully this ha- what's happening now has not, not too much of an impact on everyone. But it, it's so exciting and it's, um, it's going to be good. But next year, it's going to be massive for sport, isn't it? You must be thinking yeah. about your calendar being absolutely packed out. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> And actually, and without wishing to put a downer on it, I think for the Rugby League World Cup, that's not ideal because it, it looked quite a fallow year. So we, you know, we didn't have it all to ourselves, but we had quite a big bit to ourselves. So there will be, <laughs> there have been a lot of very big events that should have been taking place this year, which will be taking place next year, which means um, our editor's going to be absolutely flat out all year because he does uh, the athletics, he does the Olympics, he's the lead up for it, as is our director. I know, I don't know quite what they're doing. I hope they're resting up good and proper and and they're not getting a holiday next year because they're going to go right the way through the whole thing. And um, it is going to be incredible. And if, if the country's on a roll, um, I mean, if you go back to 2012 and stuff like that, if, if the country's on a roll and rugby leaking on the back of that, you know, in the autumn and, and keep that roll going, that will be huge because it, it is uplifting. Hopefully the weather's you know, closed in a little bit so people want to be indoors by that point. Um, yeah, and we can give them a really good festival of, of rugby league and, ah, oh, you know, we, we've got close. But it, it, if England, in, both, in, in all the codes that we're going to have, can lift those trophies, I just think it will be, it'll just be so, so big for the game in this country. And we'll probably need it after the year that we've had this year. And hopefully people just get the sport bug. So you know what it's like, like with the super, the super over, is it, what's it called, super over in the cricket, what happened last year? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, the I, I watched that and I never watch anything. So I think if people just catch, not watch anything, I don't really watch cricket. It's not my sport. I don't really understand it. I'm starting to understand it a little bit more now. Courtney's here and picking in my ear about little certain stuff about cricket. But... I watched that, absolutely amazing. And if it were on the next week or something similar on the next week, I'd be like, I'm watching that as well. So hopefully it'll just be like snowball effects and everyone will just be missed sport that much and they'll have been working out like crazy in quarantine and doing all sorts of stuff that everyone just gets the bug to be a bit more active and, and get on the back of it. But I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It'll be great. And to see the wheelchair as well as the men's and the women's all at the same time, um, it'll, be, it'll be really exciting. But we've... Um, we spoke about what's happening next year. So what, what do you think for your boxing then? I did say we'd come back for it. Is it going to be on this year? Is it going to be next year? I, I don't know, just partly because, you know, obviously the arena the arena might get um, booked up as well. And I don't know. I haven't been in touch with them. And obviously I'm not really training. I, 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 I There's a part of me that's kind of blocked out the actual fact I've got to fight at the end of all of this. Um, I'm, I've really enjoyed the training. I've always loved boxing and I knew I'd love chunks of the training. I spoke to Helen Skelton, who did the celebrity. She did it for Sport Relief a few years ago. She said, you'll love the training until they make you spar. Um, actually, I hated that at first. And I, I'm, I am slightly dreading it. My son, who you know, keeps on flicking jabs at me, and I'm just like, oh, my God. Um, and, and even even when Sean, when we were training, just sort of flicked the glove out back at me, and I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't like that. So, yeah, hitting pads, where you know where they're going to be and they're telling you what to do. Love that. <laughs> but the... Not great about hitting a person. They kept saying, oh, you should take on Jenna Brooks. You know, your BBC versus Sky touchline reporters. That'd be a really good story. Like, oh, I really like Jenna. I don't want to hit Jenna. We're, we're good mates. Um, and so I haven't met my opponent. Um, I'm sure she's lovely. Um, but I kind of don't want to meet her. <clears> I, 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 
I'm, you know, I'd love to come become friends with her afterwards and all the rest of it. But I'm not really, I, I have got a sort of aggressive streak, but not necessarily hitting somebody, if that makes sense. You know, if I was always reasonably competitive and stuff and I'll, I'll, I'll go for a ball in football, go whatever. But yeah. I don't sort of sit there and think, actually, I actively wish to punch that person in the face. I might think it, but I wouldn't actually want to do it. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I kind of, it was one of those things, you know, when you, you ask a question of, oh, are women doing this? And the next thing is, you find yourself doing it. Not helped by Helen Skelton and the Rob Burrow gala no, dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She, she stretched me up like a kipper, didn't she? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. When you got an entire room chanting, do it, do it. You know, like, thanks. I like and you were stood next to Josh Rowan as well. It was kind of just like, come on <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I was I was properly stitched up like a kipper so and, you know and it's one of those things they will say you should do things you know put yourself out of comfort zone challenge yourself all those kind of cliches so I'm certainly doing that and it's you know I suppose it's given me a bit of focus during this of thinking yeah you might still have to do this kid um yeah. she's a lot younger than me plays rugby league so she's fitter than me so but yeah shorter than me I think I, 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 I said to someone I think it was one of the under-19s the other day I said they had said something to me like, "Yeah, you you should be doing that," and I said, "No, I'm I'm ten years older than you at least." And they were like, "With age comes experience, so you're just gonna have to play that one." Yeah, and experience of what though? <laughs> life experience. <laughs> I'm not sure. Life experience. When you step through the ropes, well, what Sean said to me, he said, "We'll teach you all of this. You'll go in there. You'll it, you'll completely forget it all. It'll be absolute carnage, but hopefully you'll win at the end of it." <laughs> Just our ambitions of just doing this. <laughs> well, you've got one of the best in the business training, yeah. And I was going to ask you if you've got an aggressive streak because I, I, I'd have to do what you're saying and kind of take the emotion out of it. I'd have to, it, I'd think that I've got that switch that if someone said something to me or did something to me, then that's when I'd be kind of like, right, we're on. But I'm the same as you. I wouldn't be able to hit someone that I knew or kind of, I, I just, I think it'd have to be something that'd get me wound up. Yeah, I, I, I say I don't I don't want to get to know her before. I kind of hope we don't meet. She's in Hull, so that's so you know it's not my patch um, for the day job. Um, I, I mean the other thing I've absolutely loved. Sean has been an absolute gem. I mean he's just an absolute gentleman, and uh, he's really funny. We come from completely different worlds, so I'm learning an awful lot about the world from him. But he's been absolutely fabulous, and he kind of, he did admit to me after we'd done a few sessions. He said, "I only said yes to this because you thought it was a really good cause, and I, you know, I wouldn't be a nice person if I said no." Uh, because I'm really enjoying this. Oh, that's fantastic. Phew, thank goodness for that. Um, and I'm and genuinely, I'm missing him. I'm, I'm missing spending an hour and a half, two hours here. Do, do. We have a bit of a chin wagging around, you know, the training part of it. Um, so, I mean, that, that's just been really, really nice. And it was lovely to chat to him yesterday. I rang him on my way home just to catch up and see how he's doing. And he's still cooking like a Trojan. <laughs> he cooks for countless people. <laughs> so, sad that they're doing food boxes for them. So, yeah, it, it's it's... I think training will be fun. Um, hopefully, I won't get hurt because, well, who knows what's going to happen? I was meant to be doing the your first Ashes test the following day, so I did have to ring the editor and say, "Mark is presenting, isn't he?" In fact, I think I texted Mark saying, "Yeah, I know it's a long way off, mate, but you are planning to do the Ashes series, aren't you?" And present. He said, "Yeah, why?" So. Well, I'm supposed to be boxing the night before. And it's all right if I'm on the touchline, I've got a black eye. I'm not sure it looks quite so good if I'm presenting it. We take a bit of explaining that. And I just got like, ha, 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 yeah, do it, I'm on. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll be absolutely brilliant. And like you say, you've got to do stuff that puts you out your comfort zone. I don't think I'll be brilliant. I just hope I'll come out in one piece. Oh, you've got you've got to be positive. You've got to say it. You've got to say it to believe it. So I, I believe in you. Um, you'll do you'll do brilliant and like you say it's for a good course and getting yourself out of your comfort zone and and giving yourself something to channel your your uh and channel yourself to and be productive is is brilliant and you spoke about helen skelton who did throw you under the bus i will i will agree <laughs> she did do that to you um she's doing the sas who dares wins oh, so yeah, she, she she was nice. a box in that first in that opening um opening round but i think the 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 ones who didn't rank themselves the highest didn't get too much of a hit, I don't think. So maybe escape that. But is that something you fancy? Do you think you'd be able to do something like that? No, no, no. She's welcome to all of that. Um, Scales is she's incredible. I mean, she's run marathons. She's, I mean, when you go back to a Blue Peter day, she did all of the really, all the really tough challenges she seemed to do. I would think she'll really enjoy this. Um, and I, I saw an article she'd done with, with Richie, which is said she's far fitter than I am. Um, no, I don't really. And I don't like being shouted at. 
I really don't like being shouted at very much at all. So the thought of being shouted at from morning, noon till night by aggressive men, no, thank you very much indeed. You'd have to yeah. bite yourself. I was watching it the other day and thinking, I, I don't know how I'd react. I think I'd be able to get by it, but it it it, it push not not the actual physicality, the shouting bit. I think I'd have to um, really, really bite my tongue and I'd feel like a little bit of um, a petulant teenager who's kind of wanting to say something back, but you just you can't do it, can you? But she does look to be doing brilliant. I watched her on um, A League of Their Own as well when they do the right guard challenge, and she she smashed that. So she seems like she enjoys channeling herself to be competitive um, and things like that. But it sounds like whether it's this year or next year, you've got um, plenty on with the boxing and looking forward to a big year of sport. Um, I hope hopefully that you keep them well as well over this this next couple of um, months, and if you. If you fancy trying the um, road bike and you're going to put the pedals on, you'll have to let me know. I'll be able to give you some top tips, um, definitely, because it took me... I actually had to um, get on the bike static. So someone holding the bike, put it on a... Like a so I could cycle without it moving and practice uh, locking in and locking out because it's... Um, yeah, it's hard to start off with. But once you get going, it's a game changer. And yeah, no, that's why everybody says... It's not too bad of falling off and staying on. <laughs> so... Yeah. I'm only gaming. I'm a bit of a worse about falling off. <laughs> Why the heck am I boxing if I'm worried about falling off a bike? Yeah, there's, there's, there's got to be a screw missing on this one, isn't there? That, that screw loose. is a little bit backwards. But thank you so much. I could talk to you all afternoon, and but I know you've got stuff to be getting on with. It's, you've got work on your day off, which um, just shows how hard you are working at the moment. So thank you for taking some time out to talk to me. Um, and thank you for, like you say um, earlier on, that people encouraged you. You have been more than encouraging to me over the past sort of year when I've been dabbling and trying my hand at doing stuff like this. So thank you very much. Um, but great to catch up with you and I hope you keep well over the next couple of months. Yep, keep safe. That's all we've got to do. Cross your fingers. We'll be back talking about rugby league and you can come in and see us in the studio. Yeah, hopefully. Not too long, not too long. Right. Take care. <laughs> see you soon.